Welcome to this um, edition of the Interacoustics Academy webinar series um, and a warm welcome uh, to those joining us um, in the recorded version as well. Um, this is uh, a talk offering an overview of the uh, frequency following response. My name is Michael Maslin. I'll be the um, person whose honour it is to, to offer that, that um, overview. I'm a, an international clinical trainer with the Intraacoustics Academy and an audiologist as well. The Intraacoustics Academy, of course, is the um, team of audiologists who offer clinical training and um, education um, for the various audiological and, and vestibular um, applications um, on behalf of Intraacoustics. Over the course of the um, talk, these are just some um, pointers for uh, where, uh, of the topic area that I'd like to sort of touch on. So we'll spend a little bit of time going through the, the basic principles underlying this type of evoked potential, the, the frequency following response. Um, just uh, perhaps um, initially taking a, a kind of wide angle view and, and a refresher of some basic concepts related to transient evoked responses and um, sustained evoked responses. Um, and, and also um, where that fits into the terminology with this FFR, um, a certain type of steady state, if you like, response. Um, once we've gone through those um, discussion of the sort of principles, then we'll um, talk a little bit more about the practicalities for um, measuring um, and interpreting the, ASS, the, the FFR. And uh, finally, we'll, we'll close by a certain nod to the future um, potential clinical and research um, interests and applications. Now, I've started this slide again. This just to recap you is just a um, this is just a uh, kind of a, um, a, a wide-angled view, um, just to give us a little bit of starting context. So this is showing this sort of basic patient journey um, where evoked potentials might be concerned. Um, and I've used the phrase ABR here because um, much of our discussion will have a slant towards uh, brainstem responses. Um, but uh, this might apply typically for a pediatric patient, but it, it doesn't necessarily, um, it's not exclusively so. But um, transient and also steady state type auditory brainstem responses might well be used in various stages of a patient journey from screening uh, for, for detection of a, uh, the, the likelihood of a hearing loss, high or low risk, um, a diagnostic assessment. Sometimes ABRs are even used in the um, phase of a, a patient journey where an, in, where an intervention is, is reached, amplification. Um, particularly here, I'm talking about uh, the EABR evoked via the cochlear implant, if, if that was um, involved. But then also um, evoked potentials such as the ABR might also be used in the evaluation stage um, uh, where, where the validation of a, a fitting success um, of, of a prosthetic instrument could be, could be um, under scrutiny. And um, both of all, all of these um, steps in a patient journey might variously involve um, tools for uh, that, that are based on the steady state responses. Um, and I'm showing here a, um, a picture of the um, intraacoustic Sierra device, which is um, focused on, on the steady state response. And um, also, though, the other perhaps more... Uh, um, e easily to fix on uh, sort of application is in the um, the wider diagnostic uh, phase of a patient journey where both transient and steady state responses bear a, um, a, a heavy role. Now this is just a kind of composite view of uh, the family of evoked potentials that um, arises from the central uh, auditory, auditory system. And I'm just showing the concept of transient responses here in a, in a simplified manner, which I hope is just a kind of uh, reasonable, a convenient starting point um, for, uh, for, the, for the rest of the discussion. 
um, and conceptualizing auditory evoked potentials in general. And of course, the idea is that a sound triggers a burst of uh, synchronized nerve impulses that propagates in a, a certain bottom-up sort of a manner through the central auditory system. And this is, to a large extent, um, a first pass at the notion, a simplified uh, concept as to what in reality happens. But anyway, that bottom-up sort of notion, and as the synchronized nerve acti activity does so, does propagate through um, the auditory system, then we can observe a sequence of, of waveforms, which are voltage fluctuations, recorded by sensors positioned on the scalp surface and the voltage fluctuations correspond in some way to the, the neural activity. But um, yes, uh, an important point here is that we are viewing these uh, voltage fluctuations on the left panel there as a, a function of time along the x-axis. And um, most commonly, although not always, um, we, when viewing responses as a function of time we tend to refer to these as uh the um in, in we, we tend to be looking at some kind of transient response um whereby a discrete sound was used to trigger a discrete response and then we resolve this in the sort of in the time locked averaging process and then multiple presentations of the sound are presented in in sequence um, in order to try and cancel out the non-time locked uh, voltage fluctuations. But here's the important bit. Transient here refers really to a sufficiently low rate of uh, stimulus presentation such that as the response is completed, um, the, uh, only then, uh, only at some point later does um, another uh, stimulus and um, an ensuing response arise so that we have these discrete um, signals and um, responses that are separated in time. Um, just to just to clarify, of course, this this trace on the left is a composite image of the major groups of transient um, auditory evoked potentials: the early latency responses, the middle, and the long latency responses. In reality, we don't tend to see them in this uh, way, where everything is on on the screen at the same time, but rather we focus on each group separately and uh, the x-axis is displayed sort of linearly rather than logarithmically like like we see here. Now the um, the next thing to uh, just perhaps touch on is that going back half a step we could choose to consider the voltage fluctuations as a function of time but we could also um, consider uh, uh, the, the same information as a function of uh, frequency, the various different frequency components. And broadly, we see a basic pattern whereby the earlier the latency in the um, time domain, then typically the higher the frequency content. And that's what I'm attempting to show here um, in this panel where we see in the frequency domain um, moving from bottom to top on the screen um, higher to lower frequency responses and in the uh, time domain corresponding to earlier um, and then progressively later latency responses. And if we had again just a somewhat simplified um, notion um, as compared to the reality but if we did have um, some correspondence to spatial generation then as we see on the right hand panel of the screen this might broadly be um, reflecting a sort of uh, bottom up sort of uh, architecture. Um, so now uh, just moving the conversation on a little bit uh, to, to sort of um, the potential sustained responses. So transient or onset um, offset type responses um, occur following a change in the stimulus. Um, we'd like a, a stimulus that can activate or, or um, stimulate synchronously um, a population of uh, nerves and we can conceptualize in our mind's eye perhaps the um, auditory nerve and the auditory brainstem response here just, um, just represented if you like by the information we see on the left hand side of the screen. And if we have a synchronously a sufficient, sufficiently large population of synchronously firing neurons, then we can generate a response that's measurable at the, um, at the, at the scalp surface. And so each of these 
um, little blips that we see on the left hand side of the screen represents maybe for example one nerve fiber amongst the population of uh, the auditory nerve fibers and um the the um, um and and the peaks re might represent the action potential from each of those individual fibers um arising synchronously in response to the um the the uh, abrupt onset sound at the top um le leaving us with um a measurable uh, compound action potential at the scalp surface um, as you might well know, in reality, the basilar membrane tends to lead to a certain smearing of um, the uh, temporal synchrony. And so um, a click sound like this, well, this is where the, to compensate for this effect, this is where the, the CE chirp comes in. We won't go into that in more detail as that's been discussed elsewhere. But just hypothetically, that onset response might be the synchronous um, activation of a group of, of fibers. One problem with... Um, a click, in, as I'm showing in, in this example, is of course that it does lack a certain frequency specificity. So it, it's limited when it comes to um, audiometric purposes. But we could turn our attention to this middle panel, if you like, and um, here we have a certain increase in the frequency specificity um, right by using um, a tone burst. And this has a slightly less abrupt onset um, to 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 um, uh, help uh, um, with that frequency specificity and um, thereby allowing assessment of sensitivity of different frequency um, uh, tuned um, neur neurons um, or, or places, if you like, on, on the basilar membrane, the tonotopic relationship there. So we might expect a similar notion um, of the onset response, but with a subset of neurons that are um, tuned accordingly. And so there's our onset response. Um, and interestingly, if we uh, lengthen uh, the stimulus, and this is what I'm showing on the right-hand panel, then the transient ABR, as long as we don't change the speed or the, the abruptness of the onset, so, for example, components like the wave 5 of the, of the ABR or perhaps the compound action potential, as I was discussing, they might not be expected to change a great deal um, because it's an, an onset response, a transient response. But there will, of course, be some neural activity downstream from that lengthened um, stimulus and that might result from the plateau uh, region of such a stimulus the, the region where the response was on in a steady uh, manner and indeed perceptually such a longer sound would uh, be louder and depending on the frequency of the stimulus there might be um, some uh, measurable level potentials from this plateau region and this is the basis of our discussion about the sustained um, response so briefly, fibers that all discharge together at the onset, or indeed at the offset, as I show on the extreme right-hand side of the screen, um, but um, um, any uh, evoked neural activity that continues to discharge over the period of the stimulus, not necessarily um, uh, all as synchronous as the onset or the offset, um, a, a more random and uncoordinated um, pattern, um, but may tend to um, uh, lead to to a um, a, a measurable far field response. Now, I just want to take a sort of half a step back for a moment because, um, in my view, and there is uh, perhaps different schools of thought on this, but I've always found that the the um, electrocochleography is a very nice um, entry point into um, just teasing apart. Um, a little bit more about the, the transient versus the sustained um, response. And some people indeed um, would, would describe elements of the, um, uh, of, the, uh, um, of the electrocochleography measures, in particular the cochlear microphonic, as the quintessential um, frequency following response in the way that it tracks um, a stimulus over the duration. So um, what I'm just going to uh, do here is is is, um, is is think about measurements that might be obtained from an electrode that's placed in the ear canal, so a TM trode, um, and and um, a voltage fluctuations between that recording site and another external position such as the earlobe or um, or on the scalp. But importantly, here we're talking about. Um, a tone burst as a stimulus, a, a relatively long duration tone burst. Here we show a response to, uh, or here we show a stimulus, 14 milliseconds in, in duration.
And here's some examples of the type of um, response um, that one might see from such a stimulus and, and recording a setup as we saw in the, in the previous slide. So um, what we can see are a, a, a series of traces to tone bursts of different frequencies. And we see um, I've labeled the region where you see the transient uh, response and onset response that might be um, components of the compound action potential. But I've also now labeled um, a, a longer duration uh, response, which corresponds with the duration of the stimulus, that 14 milliseconds stimulus. And um, this is the sustained response, um, which originates, as I say, we're mentioning electrocochleography, um, is thought to originate in this case from uh, the uh, hair cell population. Um, so I'll just break that down a little bit with the aid of this um, this slide here. So on the right-hand side of the um, screen, we see um, just a, a visual direction towards what are thought to be the nerve generators of that compound action potential, um, the, the auditory nerve fibers there, and um, the, the onset response, so the synchronous firing at the beginning uh, um, uh, of that of that stimulus train, but then drawing your attention more towards the panel on the left, then we can see that um, we 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 could conceptualise that as the stimulus, uh, um, as the vibrations um, cause the basilar membrane to, uh, as the sound vibrations cause the basilar membrane to to move up and down um, in response to the spectral qualities of the stimulus. Um, then the hair cells should uh, modulate their response accordingly in a graded fashion. And um, this is the basis, of course, of the, um, the cochlear microphonic um, with generators in both the inner and outer hair cells, but also um, that sustained potential um, most likely to be reflecting primarily um, inner hair cell activity and sometimes described as the um, summating potential. And this um, DC shift which is shown by the, the red line is the basis of that, um, that offset in, in the previous slide. And it's um, thought to be related to um, the way in which the operating point of inner hair cells is, um, uh, is, is, is asymmetrical, whereas um, not thought to be the case with um, the, the outer hair cell population. And so going back to how that could appear, then, um, yes, we see uh, the, the, uh, the onset, uh, the transient component of the response, the action potential here, um, as measured with a, a, an eclipse device, but also um, uh, a more sustained um, a, uh, um, a firing pattern, which we can um, attribute to the DC shift, the, the summating potential. A couple of points on, on it, um, just, just to note, couple of finer points. So we can see, uh, firstly, that the DC shift from the inner, uh, inner hair cells, you would think should be constant across the stimulus duration. But in fact, what we actually see is a DC shift that seems to gradually drop off back to the baseline. And this is probably more likely to be related to sort of technical limitations of, um, of the uh, um, recording approach for an alternating current when this is a DC current, a direct current, a sustained component. Um, but also, if we just turn our attention momentarily back to the earlier um, slide, this is a depiction of um, similar responses from the, um, from the published literature, um, then um, we can see this curious uh, pattern, particularly apparent for the um, 500 hertz um, trace, but also to some extent apparent in the 1 kilohertz trace, where the... Um, where they seem to uh, exhibit a certain, the, the DC shift also has riding on top of it a certain sinusoidal uh, component. And this is probably a neurological potential um, related to um, a, a phenomenon called phase locking of the auditory nerve. And um, we can take a closer look now at this interesting phenomenon because I think that it's relevant to the um, rest of our discussion about the frequency uh, following response. So what is um, meant by phase locking in this, certainly in this context is um, 
the phenomenon whereby um, a neuron and uh, a, an action, a, a, a nerve fiber of the auditory nerve, for example, um, might discharge at a very particular phase within the stimulus cycle. And it's a common feature throughout the auditory system. Um, and through this uh, sort of recurring um, element to the stimulus, then the period of the stimulus can be um, encoded neurally. But what we can see here, for example, is one cycle of a sinusoid, and we can see um, that in the top left, the red trace. And um, when the uh, phase of the uh, sinusoid is in the condensation phase, then the resulting hair cell response that we see in the middle panel is um, towards uh, the direction that does not tend to promote um, an action potential on the corresponding auditory nerve. But when the phase of the stimulus is in the rarefaction, and that's um, th then the uh, um, stereocilia are deflected in such a way that that should lead to um, a higher probability of a nerve response occurring. And if we were to um, re reverse the phase of the, um, uh, of the stimulus, then um, the uh, nerve, the corresponding action potential that we trigger on the, on the nerve should therefore arise at a different time because it is phase locked. So it will um, be triggered in response to the rarefaction phase in this um, case of, of, this, of the cycle, wherever that um, occurs in time. And the um, reason why rarefaction tends to lead to the depolarization and then the action potential is because the rarefaction draws the basal membrane upwards to deflect the hair cells in such a way that the um, uh, neurotransmitter is, uh, leads to nerve firing. And if the basilar membrane is moved in the opposite direction, as occurs with a condensation phase, then this is what leads to um, a, redu a reduced likelihood of this occurring. So phase locking. And um, at least for the lower levels of the auditory system, it's often thought or often attributed with um, uh, a certain upper limit of stimulus synchronization. So that declines as the frequency increases and um, is relatively reliable up to around 1500 hertz, but progressively reduces um, in, in reliability, the ability to phase lock as, as stimulus increases, at least with respect to the lower um, levels in the auditory system. Um, it's thought that uh, um, generally the ability to phase lock is um, going down with frequency as one looks at um, um, nerve generator sites further along the auditory pathway. So what might that look like with a sustained or ongoing sound? Well, here we have, of course, in the uh, top part of the, tr um, of the display, um, a, a hypothetical uh, stimulus, and we're sort of labeling the rarefaction and the condensation uh, phases of that sinusoidal stimulus. And what I'm attempting to show in the, in the middle and the, and the bottom um, areas of the display are, um, are the way in which uh, the corresponding nerve, uh, synchronized nerve activity should always occur at the same point in the stimulus cycle. And so as we then measure a, um, a response at scalp, scalp um, surface electrodes, then um, we, uh, we might expect to see a certain um, uh, a sort of um, a, a rectified response where the, um, the, the voltage fluctuation sort of represents one phase, the rarefaction phase of the stimulus. Um, if we were to use an alternating polarity of um, uh, sound, so if we were to switch the um, stimulus polarity in this uh, direction, which is often the case in reality, then um, what would happen is that the uh, corresponding hair cell activity would, of, of course, um, fit this uh, reversed uh, polarity stimulus. And so the uh, corresponding neural activity would then align up with that, um, with that timing effect. But we would um, merge the responses to uh, both of these, um, both of these uh, alternating stimuli um, together into the same averaged trace. So the resulting um, potential that we record at the scalp surface might be expected to um, resemble something like this when we uh, merge those two um, separate um, the responses to those two separate stimuli together. So um, this effectively uh, doubles the frequency of the response as compared with 
if you like, the frequency of the stimulus. And um, to a large extent, those voltage fluctuations might be attributed to the hair cell responses themselves, the cochlear microphonic, but also riding on top um, of, of that would be the uh, rectified nerve activity, which might indeed result in certain um, uh, phase-locked um, uh, peaks occurring. And that's what I'm showing in the very bottom tray. So along the top, we have a stimulus, the sinusoidal stimulus, um, just to one phase, one starting phase. Then we have um, the corresponding hair cell activity, and that leads to uh, the middle trace, which is the um, hypothetical cochlear microphonic, the quintessential frequency following response. But then riding on top of that, um, the rectified nerve activity, which is phase locked, so that the uh, compound response that we might actually measure has some, um, and, and this is shown at the, um, this is shown in the bottom trace, has some components that might be in this, um, for the purposes of this discussion, hair cell related, but others that might be neural uh, in origin. And so this shows something of a breakdown of this whole concept that I've attempted to unpack there in um, a little bit more detail. So we have here some evoked potentials measured from an eclipse to a tone burst. This is a low frequency tone burst where we should expect um, good quality uh, or high ability to phase lock. Um, and uh, it's a 525 hertz uh, tone burst. And I'll draw your attention firstly to the bottom two traces where it's uh, the uh, separate responses to um, the tone burst with a starting phase rarefaction, that's labeled A, and a starting phase which is in the condensation direction, and that's uh, labeled B. And we can see some evidence of both the, the um, quintessential cochlear microphonic, if you like, that frequency following response, but also um, some, uh, some blips that um, uh, perhaps only apparent when you overlay the two traces like I've done this or becomes perhaps more apparent because they're always there, these blips in the same phase, the phase locked uh, response of the, um, um, the auditory nerve. Sometimes this response is called the auditory nerve neurophonic. And I've just arrowed these blips to sort of show you those um, those phase locked uh, nerve um, responses that seem to be riding on top of the, um, the, the the cochlear microphonic. Now, in the middle trace, um, the purple one, which is labelled the difference trace, then this is a subtraction of the A and the B traces. And so, what this tends to do is uh, maximise our um, uh, our kind of impression of the. Uh, of the of the cochlear microphonic but the very top trace the red one which is the sum trace this is the frequency doubled response that i was showing you in the in the previous slide and if we um just take this uh this this kind of um, hypothetical overlay of the two the a and the b curves as they're overlaid together at the bottom of the slide um then we can see how um the um, A and the B when occurring together should lead to that frequency doubling and um, if we move that up on the slide we can see that how that overlays nicely with what we actually recorded. Now then going back to the frequency components of these um, uh, of these traces then we had the 525 hertz stimulus and this is the spectral um, content of that uh, of that stimulus shown in the left hand panel and the frequency following response to the um, either the the raw trace with the starting phase rarefaction the a trace um, the starting phase condensation the b trace or the difference between them which tends to em emphasize the uh, fundamental frequency that's shown in the middle panel and we can see a corresponding uh, spike in the frequency content that matches the stimulus, so it's frequency following response. But then as we look at the frequency content of the red trace, that was the frequency doubled response, then we can see that the content of that has a spike, not at 525 hertz, of course, but at uh, 1050 hertz. Um, and so the frequency doubling is merely a, an artifact, if you like, of the way in which we've um, combined the two traces and, and the, there was no um, there was no stimulus component at that at that at that um, at that frequency that 1050 hertz frequency in, in this example so um, to round up where we're up to now um, so the cochlear microphonic and the uh, summating potential these are examples of um, 
a, a following response that um, follows either the spectral content of the signal in terms of the cochlear microphonic or the envelope of the signal in terms of the summating potential. And then what we were just looking at there, the, um, in this case the, the neurophonic, is can be called a, a spectral FFR. It's a neurological response that um, tracks the spectral content of the sound and relies on phase locking, so isn't typically recordable uh, with, uh, with stimulus frequencies um, uh, above around 2 kilohertz. But there is, um, of course, another um, notion which I'll just introduce at this point, and this is a frequency following response, a neurological response that can track the envelope of a, a, a sound, um, and the carrier of these sounds can be above 2 kilohertz, but the envelope, to, in order to trigger a frequency following response, needs to be modulated in some way. It needs to be um, changed periodically. Um, and when that happens, a periodical modulation, sometimes this response might be referred to as the ASSR. And so there is some degree of, I think, overlap with uh, the two uh, notions. Many people are familiar with the ASSR, the auditory steady state response. Um, we could also modulate the envelope of the sound somewhat aperiodically. And um, this leads to other types of evoked potential, sometimes known as, for example, the speech um, ABR. There's some degree of um, um, uh, similarity in concept, I would say, between the two. Now, let's just have a quick recap of the ASSR. Oh, a bigger part of before we do some some um, uh, just some illustrations there. So the cochlear microphonic and the summating potential, the red um, DC offset. Um, uh, the, the response we were just looking at that follows the spectral content of the sound, the fine structure, if you like, um, and something that follows the envelope of the sound when we modulate it. So here we're modulating the amplitude of a carrier in a periodical way, and then perhaps in a periodical um, amplitude modulation, as might happen with speech signals. Um, just a quick notion, a, a quick recap on the sort of um, the notion of the ASSR there, um, a periodical amplitude modulation. So here we have a carrier frequency of one kilohertz and we're modulating the amplitude at a rate of 90 hertz. And the phase locking that we might be referring to here in a sense is the probability of um, the uh, nerve firing as a result of where we are in the amplitude modulation cycle. So is the stimulus um, intensity at a high point or a low point? And um, of course, what we'd expect in a kind of uh, histogram of the um, response probability, as we see in this middle panel, then the, the firing probability should um, increase as the, um, mod as the modulation of the amplitude goes up and down accordingly. And so what we might see in the time domain, as shown hypothetically in this bottom trace, is um, a response that has a sinusoidal component that follows the envelope of the modulation. And um, of course, this is, um, uh, in this case, 90 hertz. This is not an acoustical, uh, there's no acoustical energy in this stimulus at 90 hertz. The acoustical energy is at 1000 hertz, but it's the... Um, it's the entrainment of the neural activity that's following the envelope that's um, apparent at, at 90 hertz. And um, when one um, describes this, of course, the ASSR is very often analyzed in the frequency domain where there's the frequency content of that sinusoidal um, nerve response shown in the middle panel um, uh, in the time domain is then analyzed to have a look for the characteristic modulation frequencies as we show here at 90 hertz and, and the various harmonics. Um, although I showed an amplitude modulated tone, quite often we think about a discrete sound such as a chirp as um, having the ability to trigger an ASSR as well. Um, and uh, a chirp could be presented at a low rate, as I'm showing in the top panel. And uh, here we have um, sort of very transient responses only because they're separated in time. One response is um, finished before the next um, response begins. As we gradually increase the rate as we move down the page, then we can get to a point where we have um, a sustained or ongoing potential and the um, um, and the rate of the, uh, of the peaks arising should correspond with the repetition rate. It's a different way, essentially, of describing the, um, same, uh, the same concept that we were showing in the previous slide.